at sirimangalo.org colon eight zero 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 front slash live. Somebody can post the link. If anyone has the link. No, that's not the link. Okay, so we'll just wait. We've still got five minutes, four minutes before we're ready to start. Okay, so but uh, today's talk is going to be about right view. That was a topic suggested by someone on our live broadcast last night, I think. So maybe what we can do is um, at the end of today's talk, if there's anyone here who has a suggestion for next week, something they'd like to hear about, know more about, they can uh, present it. I can do that now. we got four minutes if anybody has any suggestions for next week. Otherwise, let me know before we before I leave, we'll talk about it. I mean, a lot of the ideas I'm probably just going to shoot down because I've already done a talk on them. Well, there's many, there's there's lot, several ideas that, like last night I had to say, hmm, probably not because I've done several talks on that topic. The thing about uh, the internet, it's um, in in anyone who does public speaking uh, for a living or you know, on a regular basis uh, is aware of the difference. Whereas before you could say, you could say the same thing again and again and again, it doesn't work anymore because everything's already recorded. So uh, the people you're talking to the second time have already heard what you said the first time. It's much more important to say something new. interesting because hearing the same things over and over again is actually can be a really good thing but uh, because we're also recording there's often a sort of an impetus to say something new instead new dynamic On the other hand, it's a good good part of the internet that people who want to hear the same things over and over again can go back and listen to the old talks over again. Somebody mentioned right speech. I'm not sure if I could spend a half an hour talking about just right speech. I'm not that good of a talker. Maybe I could, but off the top of my head, it seems like, wow, is that really such a big topic? I'm sorry that maybe that sounds flippant, but um, technically there's not a lot to talk about with the right speech. If I had time, I could come up with some stories about right speech. But uh, you know, as a topic, it's the kind of thing you'd talk about in a larger talk about uh, the Eightfold Noble Path. Virtue. I could talk about virtue. I mean, morality is, in general, it would make a good talk. 
people are interested because it's not just about keeping rules. I don't know that I've done many talks specifically on morality, but I have a talk about it. The virtue or ethics, however you want to say it. Okay, so it's three o'clock. I guess we'll just get started then. Welcome, everyone. Um, if anyone wants to do a video video recording, please, please feel free. I'm too afraid that my computer will crash for a third time if I try it again. So I'm not going to do video recording. But the audio will be available on our website at uh, meditation.sirimangalo.org front slash live, I think is, I think is where it is. There's a whole archive of live talks. Okay, so today's talk is going to be about right view. What is right view? And how do we cultivate right view? Why is right view important, maybe as well? So first, the general sort of an introduction to right view. Right view is the first of the eight factors of the Eightfold Noble Path. It um, has some preeminence in Buddhism, being the core of the training on wisdom. If, one way of looking at right view is, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is that it's the attainment of or it's the moment that leads to the attainment of Nibbāna, of freedom from suffering. So it's really the key factor in attaining enlightenment. And we talk about mindfulness as being the, being the key that starts the engine, but right view is, I don't know, maybe you'd want to say right view is the uh, reaching of your destination. Or if you want to go with a different kind of analogy, it could be when the engine sparks the light. So when all the path factors work together, the, the, the spark that lights the gasoline is uh, right view. So you don't practice right view necessarily. You cultivate it. And near the end of the talk, I'll talk about ways in which you cultivate it. But um, so generally, what right view is, right view is proper way of understanding, looking at the world. Um, in, in, in context, it's one of the three uh, rightnesses uh, that combats the three perversions or a perversion, not in a sort of, not in a terribly pejorative sense, or not, not, not in the way we use it today, but in, in something being disgusting or perverse. But perversion in the sense of distortion. There's, so there are three distortions or misunderstandings. No, well, not even misunderstandings. Wrongnesses is maybe good. One of them is wrong view. Wrong view is the worst. Uh, the second is wrong thought, and the third is wrong perception. So if you want to say the perversion of view, the perversion of thought, and the per perversion of perception. Perception is probably the wrong word, it's just the way we... It's, well, it, it's probably okay, but I don't think technically it is the right dictionary definition word to be using. But I'll explain what it means. So, right, right perception or whatever word you want to use, sanya, the word we use for sanya, which often just means to recognize something, um, is the most visceral and the, really the hardest and the last to do away with. So it means when you see something and you uh, react to it as being good or bad. You look at something and you're attracted to it, and that leads, of course, to, 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 to desire, to craving to attachment, and so on. Or you look at something and you're, you're uh, 
turned off by it, you're upset by it in some way or another, maybe with anger, maybe with sadness, maybe with fear, maybe with disgust. Or you look at something, third case is you look at something or you hear something or whatever, you experience something, and there is an identification with it, delusion based on it. So you look at something and think that's mine, or you look at something and think that's permanent, that's stable. You look at something and you judge it. It gives rise to arrogance. So some kind of misconception, and generally misconception of things as being permanent, satisfying, or controllable in some way or another. And this is what leads us to greed, anger, and delusion. But it's just a perception. I mean, this is, this is a habit. It, it comes up habitually. It's very hard to do away with. This is the last one that you do away with. Um, more, of course, than that, and thus easier to do away with, is wrong thought. So suppose you have a perception of something as being uh, ugly, or some someone as being inferior to you, or someone as being beautiful someone is being something is being attractive but then you think to yourself boy that thing is attractive or that thing is is going to bring me happiness right that thing is going to satisfy me that thing i can control that thing that's so a thought that comes up again these are these tend to be fairly instinctual or habitual Right? We can't control the thoughts that we have. Some people make this mistake. They, I mean, because we attach to thoughts as being self, my thoughts, right? We have this predisposition to think, think of them possessively. We get upset at our thoughts. Oh, how could I think such a horrible thing? I'm a horrible person for thinking that horrible thing, right? But that's not the nature of thoughts. Thoughts, they can come from a, a whole variety of reasons. Often they're just caused by the brain, right? The brain is the impetus for the arising of thought. And who knows what's going on in the brain? There could be a chemical imbalance. There could be any number of things. Could have eaten the wrong food. Could have some memories mixed up, some wires shorted. You know, the brain is organic, so who knows what's going on? You could have brain damage uh, of, of any sorts, you know. Could have been lack of sleep, making you think these things, lots of different reasons. But the point is that they're just thoughts. And we often make the mistake of making more of a thought than it is. We think that's our view. Well, it may not be. Now, you can have a thought about killing someone and never have any desire, you know, and, and understand fully that killing them is wrong. But the thought comes up anyway. You may not even have any anger towards the person. But silly thoughts can come up, you know, horrible thoughts can come up. And they're just thoughts. But there are those thoughts that do lead to um, more weighty emotions. Like if you think someone is 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 terrible or awful, you might you're more likely to get angry at them. If you think someone or something is beautiful or attractive, you're much more likely to become addicted to it, attached to it, to desire it. And if you think of, you know, with, with thoughts of delusion, like I'm better than that person, or I don't deserve that, or I deserve that, you're much more likely to identify with it and cultivate ego, arrogance, conceit, etc. So thoughts are also problematic. Uh, the you know, wrong thoughts. But the worst of the three, and and fortunately, therefore, the first to go, is wrong view. This is the really dangerous one. It's the one that leads us to be born in hell. And worse, it's the one that leads us to be stuck in samsara. It's what force causes us to be born again and again in... in unfortunate states, because having perceptions and thoughts, these can change. You know, you can override them with right view. But wrong view is what breeds wrong thought and wrong perception, right? If you believe 
like I know many people believe that beauty is a good thing, and that's probably not something that I'm going to convince many people, even in this audience, against. But that view is going to lead to desire. It's going to lead you to be attracted to beautiful things. You think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, this we would consider the, the it's, it's not that there's no condemnation involved. It's just considered that that is going to perpetuate the system and you're going to get caught up and you're going to be reborn again. And you're going to have to deal with all the same things that you've dealt with in this life. If you, if you have really intense desires, coarse desires, as desires tend to become coarser and coarser, and the more you become addicted to them, then uh, there's a potential for real, real delusion and... and problem in the future, addiction, really. Potentially suffering is the idea. But I mean, more more clearly, if you have wrong view that says killing is good, stealing is good, no, I believe, if you believe that killing is right in certain instances, then you're much more likely to do those sorts of activities, you're much more likely to kill and encourage killing, get caught up in killing. So that's where right view fits in, if you want an understanding. Right view is your opinion, your outlook. When you, have, when you take a thought and you affirm it in your mind, there's an affirmation, yes, that is true. So it's the difference between a thought. The difference between a thought and a view is this. A view is something, a view is the affirmation of a thought the agreeing with it. The thought can come up and you may not agree with it. You may say, no, no, that's that's a silly thought. That's a wrong thought. And if you're mindful of that, it has no effect on you because you can't, again, control the thoughts. But if you say, yes, that thought is correct, and it turns out that that thought is not correct, like you think beautiful things are going to satisfy me, and you say, yes, that is true, guess what? You've developed wrong view, according to Buddhism. And it's not wrong, and it's not, wrong isn't for any of these things. Isn't because the Buddha said they're wrong. It isn't because we don't like won't like you because you keep those views. It's nothing to do with that. Again, there's no condemnation. It's wrong in the most objective sense. The claim is made that it's not true. Wrong means untrue, means false. So that we can contest that. You can say, well, beauty actually does lead to contentment. Well, okay, that's your view. We would say it's wrong view because we would argue that it's false. It's not true that beautiful things can uh, lead to contentment. They don't lead to contentment. That's the contention. For example, there are people say that killing is right. Killing, um, say killing for food. A lot of people have this view that um, there was a thing while, a while back, Mark Zuckerberg decided that he's going to kill all the animals that he eats. If he eats meat, he's going to kill the animals. As he said, if you if you eat meat, you should kill it. That we would say is, well, there's some wrong view involved there. I mean, not necessarily, but if he has the view that killing in that case is okay, which maybe he doesn't even. He might feel really bad about it, but can't overcome his desire for meat, which is pretty tragic. But... Uh, if you have the view that, and many people do have this view that killing is, is proper, it's proper to kill. The, the First Nations people in our country, the, as you say, Native Americans, um, they, uh, they believe that it's part of the cycle. You know, when deer are, are playing the part of the hunted, and it's our part of the play. So, you know, I don't know exactly, actually, I'm kind of just paraphrasing, but they have the sense that hunting and killing is a part of the master plan and therefore is a good thing. Um, these kinds of wrong views, but, but the, the point to, to make in general is that wrong view is just a uh, view that is untrue, that goes against reality. So again, we all have claims that we make about reality. You can argue that my claims or the Buddhist claims are wrong or false. The Buddha didn't know what he was talking about, but these are the claims that we make. So that's generally what right view is. Right view is 
um, that view, a view of things that is in line perfectly with reality, whatever that may be. Now, of course, there's argument over what that is, but that's the general definition. So specifically in Buddhism, what does Buddhism say is right view? And we can first of all separate it into two categories that are you know, still related, but one category is more of a, as it relates to folk Buddhism or conventional reality. And so this is right view in terms of cosmology, in terms of um, living one's life, in terms of a, a life path, which is very important. It's not to discount the importance of it, but uh, it has to be understood that this is only conceptual, conventional. And so this is right view about things like karma. And so again, it's it's just a claim being made that uh, karma really is true. Karma really happens. You know, you can you can argue with the claim. You can you throw it out. But that's the claim. The Buddha said there is the there is the deed. There is the result of the deed. This is right view. A person who says there is no deed. There is no result of the deed. Fruit of the deed. This is wrong view. A person who says there is no mother, there is no father, in the sense that people who have done good things for you don't deserve your respect, don't deserve your gratitude. So that there is no mother, father means forget about your parents. And by extension, anyone else who's helped you. If anyone's done good things for you, don't worry about it. This is wrong view. Conventionally speaking, that's a bad thing. It's not, you know, it's just using conventions to talk about. But in ultimate reality, if you're not grateful to those people who have helped you, in ultimate reality, that's a really there's going to be a lot of bad ultimate reality coming your way. I mean, it's a lot of suffering, to put it more accurately. And another part of it is rebirth, which of course goes hand in hand with karma. People, when they think of karma, they ought, they usually think of past life karma. Even though karma can take can take effect even in this life, it uh, very often only or is is most pronounced in how it affects our next life. So in this life, you can, due to good karma of being born as a human, for example, you can avoid the results of bad karma. You can kill and steal and lie and cheat and get away with it. But when you die, you don't have any of that protection of the physical body. or You're, you're at the mercy of your thoughts. You're at the mercy of your attachments. And so... Uh, our rebirth is very much influenced, very directly influenced by our past karma. So, so rebirth and karma are generally connected. Um, it's how we explain the different realms and how one is born in the different realms, which is, of course, one of the big questions religious people have, people who do believe in an afterlife. Most deists or theists, well, theists, I guess, will say that... Uh, God is the one who decides who goes where. In Buddhism, we say your, your deeds or your habits, you really, in the end of things, decide where you go. The moment of death, all your good and bad deeds will present themselves, or many of them will present themselves, and if you cling to one strong enough, it will lead you to be reborn. And then all the other factors and your your habits will come into play and you'll form the new existence either in the womb or you'll form it by being born uh, fully formed in one of the ethereal realms like the heaven realm or the hell realm or as a brahmin or whatever. Or as a ghost, that kind of thing. So this is right view. It's um, It's important obviously because of how it affects your life. You know, it's hard to meditate if you're um, caught up in wrong view. If you believe drinking alcohol is a really good thing, well, really hard to meditate if you're into drinking lots of alcohol. If you're killing and stealing and lying and cheating, well, hard to keep your mind calm, if not impossible. 
So, yeah, knowledge about karma. Knowledge about rebirth um, tends to be useful in terms of reminding you of the importance of meditation. Of course, it extends the whole idea of karma, but practically speaking, a lot of people discard the idea of rebirth. They say the Buddha didn't teach it, or, which is a bit ridiculous, but they say things like that. They say how Buddhism is just about the present life. And there is a, you know, to some extent, that's true. I mean, the Buddha did say we should focus on the present moment, not the future, not the past. But conventionally speaking, it's it's useful to be reminded of the fact that life is short, life has an end to it, that life is uncertain, but death is certain. It helps uh, remind us, it helps focus us, it helps push us to meditate. So that's mundane right view, sort of the conventional. Now, in an ultimate sense, right view can also be, can further be subdivided into two categories. There's uh, mundane and super mundane. So mundane right view in this context, or let's talk about in general, when we talk about um, ultimate reality or right view of ultimate reality, we're talking about right view of self. Or we're talking about right view of nature of reality. So it's much more about uh, existence. I think the word is epistemology. I can't remember. There's all these words. Epistemology. Is that what exists or is ontology? Let's see. Ontology is, oh no, it is ontology, right, yeah, epistemology is about knowing, right, that's the other one, so, Buddhist ontology Yeah, well, the idea of understanding what exists, this is right view in an ultimate sense. And so this is much more related to meditation. You could argue that karma is something that you learn through meditation as well. I think that's an important point to make. But this one is more more core. And it's it's more important, I guess you could say. It's more important. And it's the, it, this is the right view that leads to enlightenment. But it's on two levels. So the first right view is theoretical. It's something that you have to learn. So people will tell you about the nature of reality. And intellectually, you'll, under, you'll start to appreciate it. Furthermore, as you start to meditate, you'll start to see it. And then intellectually, you'll say, oh, yes, there's only this. This is the way things are. It's, it's, a, it's all that which uh, contributes to your outlook. But our ordinary outlook is in terms of things. Like if you pull yourself out of second life and look around the room, You'll see, you should see a computer monitor or a monitor of your lap, your notebook, laptop, computer. You'll probably see a keyboard. If you look down at yourself, you'll probably see your hands and your feet. You'll see things, entities. You'll see a mouse on your desk, walls, lights, whatever's in your room. Maybe you'll see the teapot that you drink out of, whatever's in your room. But um, none of these things in Buddhism are recognized as actually existing. So this conventional way of, 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 of looking at reality is actually an illusion. And so right view is coming to see that in an ultimate sense, what exists is not entities, but experiences. 
And this takes a little while to learn, but intellectually it's important because if you start meditating, thinking about things, you're already looking at reality from the wrong point of view. Like when you walk, if you think of it as I'm walking, a person walking, you're missing what's really going on because what's really happening is the experiences, the feelings, and of course the thoughts and the reactions. But these things are only experiences. And when you sit and the stomach rises, if you're thinking of yourself breathing, or if you think of the breath coming into your body and the breath going out of your body, these are just concepts. Reality is just the experiences, just the feelings. But this is important. When a person begins to meditate, this is the first, first actually the first step is attaining right view. But it's right view in this, this mundane sense that has a lot more to do with the intellect than to do with than it has to do with actual experience. Some experience, but it's an experience that leads to this intellectual understanding that, oh yeah, these entities are just conceptual. What really exists is body and mind, really, or, or experience. And this continues throughout your practice. As you practice, it, it becomes strengthened and refined, and you start to understand suffering. You start to understand impermanence. You start to understand non-self. And so your intellectual outlook is improved. Uh, by the practice. The more you practice, the more you see, and um, until intellectually you're very, very clear on the nature of reality. And this is where there arises super mundane uh, right view. And this is noble right view. If you talk about the noble eightfold path, the Noble Eightfold Path only actually occurs in the moment. But it's that moment when your intellectual right view becomes a certainty, where it really becomes your view, like you get it. Up until that point, you're seeing it and you're building a hypothesis, but there comes a moment, you see, because you'll be meditating, it's through actual meditation, you know, see the same things over and over again. You'll see the same things happening. You'll, you'll, you'll see the same characteristics in everything you experience, everything impermanent, everything unsatisfying, everything uncontrollable. And it'll come again and again until finally one thing will present itself. It'll be the last thing. It's nothing special, but one thing will present itself and will be so clearly impermanent or clearly unsatisfying, or clearly uncontrollable, that you'll just get it. That's the moment where the mind switches, where the mind lets go. It's like turning a light switch. And whether you want to say turning on a light in terms of becoming enlightened or turning off a light in terms of the cessation of suffering, uh, describe it as you will, but it's where the mind is, becomes freed from samsara. That moment is as all of the Eightfold Path, uh, path Factors, including right view. I mean, most importantly, right view. Everything else is just as a result of this right view that lets you see things as they are. So that's a brief synopsis of right view. Um, I was going to go into the practices that lead us to cultivate right view, but on the other hand, I've been talking for half an hour, and we could also just, if anyone has any questions or wants to talk, Questions about Buddhism, questions about right view, questions about meditation. We could just do that instead, because I've talked, I've given several talks on how to cultivate right view. I think I've done at least one on YouTube. If I haven't, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. I'll put it to you. If anyone has questions, go ahead and ask them. If not, I guess I'll just keep talking. Or if not, then let me know that you'd like me to keep talking and that you're not all away from the keyboard or off 
chatting on Facebook instead of listening. Well, that first part of the talk's over, so I can give another talk. I'll give the rest of the talk. All right, so there are five things in the texts which lead to right view. This is not my list. It's a list that occurs in the Tibitaka, I think, in Gutta Nikaya, Book of Fives, if I'm not mistaken. And these are, in order, Sutta, Sila, uh, sorry, Sila, Sutta, Sila, Sutta, Sagacha, Samatha, and Vipassana. The five things that lead to right view. So Sila means morality. Cultivation of morality comes right view. And this I already sort of hinted at, at least, that without proper morality, you can't really see clearly. When a person is immoral, their mind is on, is aflame with guilt, remorse, fear, anxiety, paranoia, delusion, just all around messed up. That's why we call it, that's why in Buddhism we consider it immoral, not for any other reason. It's immoral because it messes you up, which is kind of perverse, I think. Many people look at that and say, that's weird. Why doesn't Buddhism care about what happens to the people you hurt, right? Because Buddhism has the idea that, or the claim that um, you can't hurt another person. If I, if I steal from you, you're only hurt because you get, you, you get upset about it. So, uh, in an ultimate sense, we hurt ourselves with our evil deeds more than we hurt other people. So if you hurt an enlightened being, you don't hurt them at all. You can't possibly, quote-unquote, hurt them. You can beat their bodies or you can take away their possessions, do whatever you want. You can't actually hurt them. You can hurt yourself, and you do hurt yourself. So, which is the interesting thing, is not only are they wrong, uh, unwholesome deeds, not only are they wrong, but they prevent you from seeing how wrong they are. Well, it's very dangerous, scary, really. Because you think otherwise, well, I can do them, and, and if they're wrong, I'll know it. Right? I'll be able to see if it's wrong. Yeah, not always, not necessarily, because they 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 preoccupy you. And if you're preoccupied with guilt or anger, or arrogance, conceit, all the things that come from doing from cultivating deeds based on these emotions, you know, you cultivate the deeds based on a certain emotion, and the emotion increases. And when those emotions are in the mind, they don't foster objectivity. So when you keep morality, when you cultivate morality, it helps you cultivate right view. It lets you see clearly. You start to see, when you give up alcohol, you start to see what alcohol has done to you because now you're sober and your mind is clear. When you stop killing, stop stealing, lying, cheating, when you're mindful of these things, you start to see more clearly and you'll start to see cause and effect, but mostly because your mind is clear. Your mind is calm. So that's the first important aspect. The idea that without ethics, it's very hard to see things clearly. The second um, factor that uh, promotes the cultivation of right view, sutta means listening or hearing. So in the time of the Buddha, there wasn't, they didn't write religious teachings down as far as we're aware of. Um, so it was all transmitted orally and chanted and memorized and so on. But what it means, this, this just means hearing from, from someone, a learning from someone else. 
listening to teachings like this. When you listen to teachings about right view, you it helps cultivate right view. It's very important. Now, there are some people who can learn the truth without hearing it. These people are very few and far between. There's far more people who think they can cultivate, they can become enlightened, let's put it in general words, without a teacher than actually can. And that's an important point we should think about. It's far common or far more common to be a person who thinks they can find the truth themselves than to actually be someone who can find the truth for themselves. That's the claim we make. It's very, very difficult to do. You can try. Not not as easy as well, as we often think. We can be fairly arrogant as human beings. I've met people who, you know, with the best of intentions and well-meaning and not bad people by any means, but have deluded themselves into thinking that they learn to find the truth on their own. They, they're on their own path, quote-unquote. Uh, so, yeah, sutta. Much easier if you find someone who has right view. Of course, the problem is how do you know whether they have right view? You're not yet having it. But to listen... And the idea being that even if you don't know who has right view, the more you listen, the more you'll be able to um, compare and contrast and put together, piece together the truth uh, that it actually will help you. Now, could confuse you. There could be an argument made that if you study too much, you can actually cultivate wrong views. But I think... You could you could argue that, but um, that would be sort of an extreme case. It, it happens, you know, people study, who study too much do exist. But for the most part, you know, that that's not what is meant here. It's not meant that we're not referring to study, study, study. We're just saying learning what is right. When you hear good teachings, for the most part, they're beneficial. I mean, I guess you you just have to say that it's not a sure case. Just hearing the truth doesn't mean you're going to get it. But not having heard the truth is a much better chance. There's a much better chance of you not getting it. The listening is an important part. With the warning that, you know, don't spend all your time listening to the Dhamma. Because once you've heard... Sort of the basics, that's really enough. The point is just to hear the truth. The third factor, sagacha, means um, conversation, dialogue. So sutta means is one way, it's passive. Like right now you're listening to me. Sagacha is actually asking questions or asking for clarification or getting into dialogue with someone else, getting into dialogue with other meditators, talking with teachers and other meditators, talking with wise people. But this is, it involves talking, expressing ourselves. And you could probably argue that part of it is just being able to formulate our thoughts into words, our feelings, our mind states, the way the way we do for when we see a therapist, right? Often therapists' only role is to listen. Um, and that's enough to allow us to express ourselves and, and sort of organize our thoughts. But I think more often it refers to, I mean, it refers to this, but probably the most common form is asking questions. And so there's this important idea that if you don't ever ask questions, if you don't ever ask the questions that you have or ask questions that express your doubts, it would be very difficult for you to, uh, or you're not, you're going to be harder for you to find answers to them. Not impossible, but uh, asking questions and getting answers or um, describing your practice to a teacher. <coughs> and asking whether you're on the right track. Anything can be useful. Describing your practice and having it critiqued. Like there's the story of Anuruddha, 
who came to Sariputta and he was concerned because he said, I can, my mind is perfectly focused and I can be aware of the whole of the solar system or the soul, whole of the, no, so the whole of the galaxy, or maybe the universe, I think, uh, at once. And yet I'm still not able to free myself and become an, an enlightened being. And Sariputta said to him, well, the fact that you say that your mind is perfectly concentrated, that's your conceit. And the fact that you, or that you say that you uh, can, can in, uh, observe the whole of the galaxy or the solar system at once, that's your distraction. And that you say you haven't yet attained enlightenment, that's your worry. And he said, if you do away with these three things, you'll be able to become free from suffering. That's a good example of Sagacha. Sariputta gave him a very good, you know, redirected him very clearly in that example. That's Sagacha. When we when we do meditation courses here, we'll the meditators will have to meet with the teacher once a day. Uh, every meditator will meet with a teacher once a day, and it's not only listening to me talk, but asking questions and discussing your practice in dialogue. And now we're doing this over the internet. Some people are taking internet courses with me, meeting once a week. We have slots for that if anyone's interested. Go to our meditation site, meditation.sirimangalo.org. And you'll see the meet page, and you can meet the teacher. That's sagachara. Number four, samatha. And samatha means tranquility. So it's important that we calm the mind. Our mind has to be calm before we can understand reality. If you practice intense calm, Um, it can lead to the jhanas, and so that's a kind of jhana samaditi. It leads to right view in regards to samatha. But more importantly is when you practice meditation, your mind settles down. Not at first, but eventually your mind starts to settle down. Your mind at least becomes more focused. And by being more focused, you're able to see things clearly. So anything you do that calms you down... If you practice loving kindness, if you practice samatha meditation specifically, you know, this kind of thing calms you down and that allows you to see some of the problems in your mind, some of the bad habits. Number five is vipassana, so the cultivation of insight. And this is more along the lines of what I was talking about earlier when I talked about the cultivation of right view, how right view um, progresses in or in seeing the three characteristics. So vipassana means to see clearly. It means to see clearly impermanent suffering and non-self, or impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and uncontrollability. That things are impermanent, unsatisfying, and uncontrollable. And as you see that clearer and clearer and clearer, this is what leads to arya samaditi, noble right view. When at the moment that you see something as impermanent or as suffering or as non-self, in that moment the mind lets go, sees perfectly clearly, and that's enough to cause the mind to let go. There you go. That briefly is a sort of broad general talk about the concept of right view. Are there any questions? Uh, Simon has a question. Start by setting your minds on that which is beautiful, going through all the jhanas and finally letting go of the jhanas, since they too must be let go of. Form of beauty, if you recall the sutta. I do recall. Kalyana is probably the word. 
Let me see if I can find it. When is that? MN, I guess. MN, what's the number? How did somebody set my clock? Weird. Uh, Salayatana, anyone, anyone? What's the number? 137, okay. Mm -hmm. Find, let me see. Yeah, well, Tanisaro has his own ideas about how to translate things. So, near the end of the sutta, the beginning of the sutta, I'm just looking at the Pali. Let's look at the English Kubodi's translation. Okay. Possessed of material forms, he is resolved only upon the beautiful. Hmm. Just the material forms. Not perceiving forms internally, just forms internal, external. Dutyadisa Subant Subantu Adimoto Hodi Subantu, what the heck is that? Subantu, Subantu. I don't think it means what they're saying it means. Mm. Atadisa, I think it's from an earlier sutta actually. Make a and he's in pain and make a at this No, wait. I don't know what Subantu means. Subantu Eva, Subantu Eva. Suba Anta. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've read this before, but never gave it much thought. Um, Bika Bodhi gives a note that it has something to do with the eight liberations which um, I'm assuming means the means the eight um, the eight jhanas no, not exactly though neither perception or non-perception is the seventh so then the eighth is the cessation of sun is uh, sunny reunion road Atta samapatiyo samapajatiyo vatiyo to desang sabatavita. Hmm. Some of it's been already already explained. So let's look up this word subantu. Arukanda Sutta. Suba, Suba, Asuba. Oh, 
Oh, asubang, I think it's asubang. It just means subang. Kind of weird Sunday, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, beautiful. That's interesting, huh? Why the um, person is resolved only upon the beautiful. Suba. That's really interesting. Something to study, something to look up. I don't actually know what's going on here with these eight. Uh, or how the eight, uh, how the eight, so the Bhikkhu Bodhi says, look at note 764. If you got his version of the Majima Nikaya, which I don't have in front of me, I uh, don't know where to find note 764, which sutta that is in, but if you look up his middle length discourses, it talks about the eight directions, I guess, it talks about the eight liberations. It seems to me it, yeah, well, something to look up. Okay, what else do we got here? Someone else with a question? Dana, Kanti da, Kanti dana, Kanti dana, maybe. What does Kanti dana mean? The gift of patience. Hmm. One who gives one who has been given to patience. One to whom patience has been given as a gift. One to whom patience has been given as a gift. Maybe that's what it means. If it has taken a person so long to cultivate an even interest in finding the truth, how can we avoid starting all over being enchanted in the world, the world in our one's next life? And we keep whatever right view. But we go by our habits. So if you're cultivating good habits in this life, that's going to keep you closer to Buddhism. If you cultivate bad habits, those bad habits are going to tear you away from it. It's really the only way. Is that Robin? Robin calling herself Kantidana? Oh, oh, oh. hi, Robin. Mm. So, uh, yeah. We, uh, well, we have no, I mean, we do have no reassurance, but, or no certainty, but the reassurance is there that cultivation of good things, and especially the cultivation of Buddhist good things, keeps you in, involved with Buddhism. Just doing good deeds in general without any relationship to Buddhism is, is not as likely to keep you tied to Buddhism, but it's still likely to keep you tied to good people and, you know, Buddhists. Uh, have have goodness because that's what we cultivate. Oops, that wasn't the right button. Hmm. Right here, that's the right one. What we do right now in this moment that matters. Right. What we do right now in this moment best way to look at things. Okay, well, if that's all, then I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Wish you all a good day. Thank you all for coming. Hope to see you all next week. <laughs>